Welcome to today's broadcast of the InGeneration Project podcast, showcasing daily excellence titled Explore the Implications Software Surveillance. We broadcast podcast episode number 46. Join us as we delve into the latest global insights with our special guest, Michael from Council of Time. We're privileged to tap into the wisdom of Michael from COT, a revered Christian apologist. For deeper insights, visit the official Council of Time website linked below. Join Council of Time in spreading God's word and truth in these crucial and generation times. Your support drives our mission and unlocks the transformative potential of a closer connection with the God, the Most High. Please show your support for the Council of Time. Now, before we delve into today's rebroadcast podcast, explore the implications software surveillance episode 46. A heartfelt thank you for your unwavering support. As we journey together, we're committed to maintaining this podcast ad-free. Your backing enables us to share God's word far and wide. Remember to subscribe, like, and message us for daily excellence in your life. Now, let's embark on today's exploration of surveillance implications in navigating the complexities of our world. Now, let's get into N Generation Project, the broadcast podcast number 46. Explore the implications software surveillance. Blessings to all. Good evening, everybody out there. Good to see you guys again. I hope everyone is doing okay. Hopefully. Hold on, guys. Let me adjust this. How do I sound? Pretty good? You guys hear me okay? Tonight, uh, late tonight, I'll be back on air for a small discussion. I will. And someone yesterday, good for you, kind of looked up those uh, companies I said were closing. Well, they came out with a uh, some sort of an announcement with a uh, more than a thousand uh, store chains are closing. To understand what's happening and to understand these closures and to understand recent uh, Commons by three-letter agencies. Uh oh. I hope you guys are ready. Do you do you all understand what it means when the CIA tells everybody to get ready for spiritual warfare? When the FBI tells everybody to get ready for spiritual warfare? When billionaires and trillionaires tell everybody to get ready for spiritual warfare, do you guys have any idea what that means? We've been reading Revelation, talking about the beast. The system of the beast, everybody has their opinion. And it's going to be a prosperous set of... uh, kingdoms, but do you understand the closeness of what we all face? Anybody? Do you? Two months ago, I believe I talked about, uh, what was it, a month ago, Bitcoin or something like that, right? You know, Bitcoin went from, what, 21, now it's at 73,000. You guys are aware of that? It's going to go way up there because we're going to utilize that system. It's a very intricate system that will be utilized. Power structures will change. You guys are right in the middle of it. Right in the middle of it. The food situation, it's also starting to alter. Everything is altering. It'll become painfully obvious due to ambitions, announcements, many announcements. And it's going to become very confusing to a lot of people. 
because most thought one thing would come about, right? Now, in order for people to get a clear picture of what's happening, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that many ideas are going to be proven wrong. What most think will come about will not. And just about all of us will be blindsided. Those of us who do not have spiritual clarity yet. But if you belong to Christ, you're going to have the greatest comprehension of what that means during these times that are ahead of us. You guys know what day it is? The COT uh, countdown, do you guys know what day it is? Anybody out there know what day it is? Oh, also, uh, they passed a bill concerning AI. So they have a panel now, a panel and four agencies that will govern the, the uh, legalities of AI. Are you guys aware of that? So that means AI regulation is in, and they had no choice but to do that. Sadly, AI is not well understood as to what it can and cannot do. But it is extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. The next step, the next thing you guys will see, is a vast change in your online social media habits. Is, is anybody out there aware of a software company called Aware? Anybody uh, you know about that company? It's called Aware. It is a software company that records every conversation on social media, on cellular networks, on computers, on everything, right? And uh, this company... This, uh, I'll call it a framework, has captured quite a bit. But there's a problem. The same people who are having conversations in private, it's now giving information to about the individuals they're talking to. We went over this a long time ago. You guys remember that? Our conversation about uh, if anybody discussed anybody else, how that person would receive messages from the individuals that talked about them. For example, if Robin and I were talking about uh, consecrated, right, consecrated would get a transcript of what Robin and I discussed. That's what's starting to happen. That's beginning to happen. Do you know what that's going to do to the Christian community? Hmm. Because that was, that was around, what, 12 years ago? About 12 years ago. I believe I sent out a warning, a very sincere warning, hoping people would deviate from their um, habits. Well, it seems many did not. This will go for senators, rich or poor, doesn't matter. If you're on social media, if you have a phone, you will eventually be caught in the web. And your information for the last, I believe it's 22 years has been cataloged. 22 or 25 years has been cataloged. So every conversation has been cataloged. Every single one. Anyway, people are going to have to deal with that too. That's going to cause a pretty big and deep fracture in relationships and friendships and all sorts of uh, ips, right? And 
other people have to deal with that. My advice to anybody out there who is a believer in Christ is to remember something. People change, right? They change. They grow. They develop. Remember that if you ever read a conversation about yourself that one of your brothers or sisters in Christ had about you. Now, I'll tell you right now, I told everybody back then, I don't care who talks about me, right? I expect that. I do. So you won't be my enemy despite what you've said. You won't. So don't worry about that for me. I don't live my life that way. Right? But uh, for all of you who may not have that type of forgiveness in you, right? This will be a trying moment. This will be a make or break moment. And that's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. So these weapons of darkness will increase. They're going to increase to a degree that all of society is going to be probably counted useless. People will not embrace each other as they once did. Backstabbing at an all-time high. Reputations ruined. All sorts of things. But if a person employ those are tributes of Christ. They don't have to worry about that. My days will be calm. They will. They'll be as calm as possible. Certainly not people problems, right? I tend to uh, agree with the gospel in many aspects, all aspects, especially forgiveness. I just hope that uh, many of you are the same. I'm not, personally, I don't have to worry about any conversation going to anybody I was talking about. I really don't. But a lot of people do, right? Because a lot of people were not at that maturity rate, that, that level of maturity where they would uh, be consistent, right? In and out of you, being the same person, often people get caught up in conversations about somebody else. They agree with opinions they probably shouldn't have. And when all that's known, you know, some people are going to have some consequential things. And that's not the only company who is launching AI products that have actually performed things they never counted on, right? AI is, is enormously challenging. It's going to be impossible to contain. And it will grow beyond its barriers. I hope that all of you are ready for that. But, uh, wow, that's going to be for, that's going to make for an interesting time. So tonight, in light of all these situations, right, I'm sure that uh, some of you, the system of the beast is something that is, uh, it, it could, it may not be well understood as far as its deeper potentials. What it looks like, what it will look like when it forms. I'm going to talk about some of that briefly tonight. My hope, right, is that you guys are armed, not with uh useless things, but with useful things, so you can be aware. Somebody says, uh, so is the First Amendment going to be attacked and taken away? In my opinion, the First Amendment was attacked 39 years ago, and the First Amendment is essentially uh, controlled a different way that you don't see. We'll talk about that, too. Rights, by the way. The emphasis on rights that you're given by the government. It, it, here, let me just give you this opinion, my opinion, please, so that you guys don't misunderstand anything. It's a good time to do that, too. Uh, 
the government is an institution with people. You have the government and positions, but then you have people that fill those positions. If you get corrupt people who fill those positions, government is going to be corrupted, right? Government has potential to go either way, but it depends on who sits in those seats, right? Who takes up those positions. Based on what's been happening in the world, it's been about 50-50 this entire time. As of late, it's been pretty bad. As of late. Rights, amendable rights, have been amended so much and tailored so much. But in truth, and given the record that we have, many people have gone out with a message. They end up missing. They end up killed. They end up scrutinized. They're unemployed. People have lost their jobs, their honor, everything else by speaking in freedom. Right now, there's a controlled speech element that's been in place for many years. People do not speak freely. They don't. Let's go ahead and face it. The speech of people is conformed to the whole, correct? Isn't that right? The speech of everybody's speech, especially in public, is tuned so they're not rejected by people. We know that people are vicious, right? What you may not know is those people often plan, and if the wrong thing is spoken, something likened to peer pressure comes into play, and that puts everything back in perspective. So while everybody thinks they have freedom of speech, do you really have freedom of speech? Can you really go out there in the world and say what you want to say? The answer is no, you cannot. That's what the answer has been for a long time. You can't. You can't do that. You can do that in small circles, but you better keep it in small circles. You cannot go out there and say anything you want to say, and it's been like that for a long time. So I'll say it again. Do we even have an effective First Amendment? It's kind of like this. It's kind of like uh, if you had a, if somebody had a stand out there full of free food, right? And this big sign that says, everybody come and get the free food. Now you have a bunch of upstanding citizens behind a barrier. Nobody wants to be seen getting free food because if they do, they just had a conversation about how low status individuals get free food. Everybody over here wants to be seen as high status. Is anybody from that high status group of people or anybody period going to get the free food while everybody's looking? No, they're not. Why? They can go get the free food. There's no consequences from that. The consequences are the people. Remember the other night when I said the problem uh, was within the nation. The bigger problem that we face in this nation are those who were born in this nation. Remember that? It'd be so easy to make it something else. Do we have a drug problem? Yes. Do we have other problems? Yes. Right? We do. We have a drug problem because demand is high. Let's go ahead and face it. <laughs> right? We do. Demand is high in so many different areas. Of course, there are going to be people who find themselves, you know, going into business for the U.S. providing drugs because the demand is high. But what will take this nation down is not any external force, but an internal force. That's what's going to do away with, well, give us a small headache for a little bit. It's going to be from the inside. To understand that dynamic is simply to understand pure pressure, societal pressure, expectations of groups, 
organizations, so on and so forth, people attempting to keep a standard in view of other people. The fear and the anxiety associated with being an outcast in these days. In schools, the number one issue of anxiety is being ousted from your peers. Do you know that? Young people are committing suicide every single day in the USA because of Facebook and TikTok and all these other things because people are rejecting them in social media. And so they go and kill themselves. So then to a young person, acceptance in social media is everything. And in order to continue to have that, you must conform to the group. So nobody is going to say what they want to say. Everybody is going to say what's convenient or conducive to a specific cause. That's been happening. It happens in politics. If somebody says the wrong thing in politics, you and I both know what happens to the individual. If somebody says the wrong thing in media, you know what happens. If somebody says the wrong thing and they're a superstar, you know what happens. You know what happens. We even have a First Amendment. Sure. Is it utilized? No. Because speech is controlled by the whole. Remember that. I think somebody used the word illusion. That's a very fitting word. There's an illusion of rights. An illusion of freedom. But in truth, it's bondage. It's not freedom. It reminds me of the words of Christ, the words of the Bible. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So where the Spirit of the Lord is not, there must be bondage. More people now, do, do you guys know that more now than ever, more and more people are taking anxiety medications or anxiety compensators? Do you know that the average family has somebody in it? who has the anxiety issues. Do you know that? The average family. Not one out of ten families, the average family. And it's these, these numbers are rising. Not because of accountability, because of what's happening with speech, with real freedoms, right? Everything is becoming a challenge. Everything is becoming some peer-based standard. And it's reinforced by consequences of society. And those consequences come by way of social media. In fact, if you mess up, everybody in the world is going to know you messed up. If you go down, everybody in the world is going to know that you went down. It's a very fragile society. You know what that forms? We talked about this at, you know, at least 15 years ago is the mob mentality. When Yahoo was out, I could see a habit forming. I could see something coming. And what it was was borders from nations are taken down. When one child or one person can talk to another child or another person in another country, and they can compare their two lifestyles, one of those children is going to reject their entire culture because of social media. And when that happens, that child is going to lose respect for where they are, desiring to live in the other place. When you do that on a national basis, you're going to have rebellion against all leadership, and it's only a matter of time before it takes an absolute toll. We live in a time now where it's going to take an absolute toll. You think the people in the USA only have an issue with their government? No. Most nations have been putting a plan in place starting in 2024 because they see a breakdown coming. Finally, they see a breakdown coming. They know a battle of battles is coming. And they are.
are preparing for it. They're being quite bold about it, too, and they're not hiding nor mincing words. There are going to be some choices you believers are going to have to make. And those choices are going to be final for many of you. My advice again, consider, have integrity about your ways with the Father and learn to trust him right away. to trust him. In other words, stop letting other people have control over your over you, causing you to be hostile. Right? Don't let other people control you that way. I know that happens. I've seen it happen. Through small trends and changes, I can see it taking effect. And that's for many of you. I can't help but to observe. So uh, don't let that, you know, please don't be offended by that. I observe everything. I do. And if you guys change because of what you agree or disagree with, imagine what's about to happen to the entire earth because of pressure. We certainly live in a very different world. So again tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about this beast kingdom, these various systems that are being put together that will quickly evolve to become something nobody count on. I personally do not believe it's going to be conventional. And still at some point we have to discuss the spiritual component to what's happening here. There is a massive spiritual component, physical interactions happening every single day that people are largely ignoring. I come back, we'll begin that discussion. I'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT. Back, everybody. We are back, everybody. I have a question for you guys before you start asking questions. I do. Did the people in the past, did they listen to the prophets? If you believe they did, type a one. If you believe they did not, type a zero. Did they listen to the prophets? Yes or no? That's a pretty big, uh, pretty big question. Curious to know what do you guys think? Very consistent answer. No, they didn't. As a consequence of them not listening, we all know what happened multiple times, right? Another question, did they listen to the apostles? Did they listen to the apostles? And we're speaking in terms of nations. Did they listen to the apostles? Nations did not listen to the apostles either, nor did they heed to the warnings. They didn't. They didn't. Does anybody know why they didn't listen? I know it gets into the uh, dynamics of these stories, but does it, anybody understand why? Is there a reason why they didn't listen? Why didn't they listen? Anybody know why? If a person reads the Bible, right, and all those stories, you'll find something interesting. When people gain power 
and sit in positions. Fruitful positions in the earth, it's a, it's a, a wonder takes place. In times of old, people listened to the status of a person. In other words, if, if a priest had a high status, right, they would hearken to that priest. If a priest had a low status, they would disregard that priest. That same consistent model could be used all throughout time, which means people listen to those they believe are successful. They do. The apostles were not successful. The prophets were not successful. But they had the truth. To have a truth is to be an enemy of the world. Try to understand this. When you have the truth, you're not going to speak in favor of the world in any degree. That makes you an enemy of the world. That makes you an enemy of those who have a high status. It really does. Those who have a high status, right? They normally gain that from some very questionable practices. Truth be told, we all know that. Somebody who carries the truth from the living God is going to have a high moral meter. And because of that high moral meter, they're not going to compromise. They won't have a high status among the nations. Because of that, people do not hearken to those with a low status. They never have. But they've always ended up paying the consequences. In other words, they hear the truth, but they hearken to the voice that connects with them. I'll say in this case, that connects with where a person wants to go. You're taught, all of you are taught that if you want to be successful, align yourself with successful people, correct? Isn't that what they teach? If you want to be successful, align yourself with a successful person. In martial arts, they teach you never align yourself with a loser. You know that? They teach that in martial arts. So this success word is thrown around a lot. And people face real hardship in this world when they don't have money. Those of high stature have money. If they don't have money, all of a sudden they're going to lose their audience. People won't listen to them, right? The world won't. That same thing has happened all throughout time to this present day. And it's so easy you know, for a nation to get caught up in the idea that, hey, we're going to be prosperous and we're going to have our fun. Why is that? Because money makes consequences of the world very real. If you don't have that money, what can you do in truth? Many people live in hardships because they don't have money. And they know what those hardships are, right? Many do. Those people who have money, they seem like they're very happy, right? Very, very outgoing, this, that, and the other. And it causes a person to want that instead of the hardship. There's this type of cruelty that goes with hardship, too. We all know this. So, in other words, to be, to be successful in this world is to escape that hardship that many are acquainted with, but never want to look back to. And so, when someone starts telling a truth, it does not align with that path of success the world often speaks of. In fact... They begin to expose the darkness of climbing to the top, so to speak. Nobody likes that because it challenges their position. 
right? It speaks against how people keep their status. So they're enemies of this of nations and of the world. Now, what does that tell you? If this is true all throughout time, does the world like the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus gave us the answer, and he said no. He said no. But where does that put us? Puts us in a very sticky situation, doesn't it? Because many of you know sometimes it's almost like choosing either or, right? There are certain things Christians of today will not discuss because they don't want to deal with giving up all of one side just to follow the other. And they're trying to find a bridge between the two. Do you know that Israel did that same thing? All these fallen nations did the exact same thing. The priests of the, those days accommodated some sort of a bridge where people could have their cake and eat it too. And it backfired miserably. In every case, when God did judge his own people, they had somewhat of a final message to walk fully in his ways and abandon all else or perish with those who disobey him. And believe it or not, the majority perished with those who disobeyed him. In today's world, to be accepted by this world is to speak what they speak, to agree with what they agree with. Those who dare to be different are ousted, pushed away, excommunicated, because they hold fast to a truth, right? These kingdoms are bound to get a lot stronger in the world. This way, not the Christian way, but the world's way is about to get a lot stronger in the world. Many of us are going to have some very tough decisions. Very hard ones. And every single last one of you have likely had a dream of this test this coming. Let me attempt to explain it to you. At some point, you had a dream. Right and wrong was in the dream. If you chose the right way, you would likely die in that dream. If you chose the wrong way, you would be embraced with the group that was wrong, but at least you would live, right? And so in your mind, in that dream, many of you faced a decision you did not want to make. The first series of these dreams, normally a person will choose the whole out of fear. They're scared half to death of the consequences of choosing the right way, and so they abandon the right way to save themselves. Do you know that same dream comes back? And you're faced with that same decision again over time. Over time, you start to see it more and more. And they always catch you off guard. So it's not like you're going to predict the circumstances. They always catch you off guard. But at some point, you'll have that same dream. And you'll choose righteousness or the moral side of things. And in that, you'll find out that the choice you were given, right? That what you thought was going to be doom is actually life. And what you thought was life is doom. That's what you find out after a series of these dreams. These are spiritual dreams, which is why I'm talking about them. How many of you have had a dream similar to that? 
had your own circumstances, but that choice was right there with you. These are spiritual dreams, almost like a proving ground. They give you a gauge as to where you actually are. How many have woken up not proud of the decision they made? Hmm? You can always tell when the series is about to begin. Because you have one of those dreams and you're involved in something you would never do in front of anybody. Right? One of those dreams. It's, that's a spiritual dream. That's when the Lord shows you the truth of your flesh. Of your own desires. And you wake up and you sing, thank God nobody saw that. Right? Nobody knows about that one. But do you guys really think those dreams come just to, you, you think it's happenstance, coincidence, or something like that? Or is the Lord preparing his people for something? Do you know how many people probably, well, I know they have those dreams, but do you know how many people in the world are not paying attention to the smallest aspects of their own lives like that dream, like those series of dreams? And how can that be true for so many believers? Your father's involved. And he certainly is preparing his people for something that has real consequences. But the world those of the world, they disregard such things, don't they? Those of the world, they compensate. They say, hey, don't worry about that. That was, you know, that's of no consequence at all. Right? They walk by sight only. They don't consider everything. Or reading a scripture. And the Lord was talking to Hezekiah. And he sent Hezekiah because he said, the people will not listen to me. Let's see if they hearken unto you. And I thought about it. I said, wait a minute. I've heard that term too many times in the Bible. The Lord saying, in fact, in Ezekiel, same thing. He sent Ezekiel. He said, the people will not hearken unto me. Neither will they hearken unto you. And I thought about it. I said, wait a minute. So the Lord told all these prophets that the people would not hearken unto him. When was he speaking? In that same Bible, the Lord speaks of the many ways he communicates with us. The things the world will disregard is your father's speech in your life. Constantly. Constantly in communication with you. But I said the world will not hear him. They won't hearken on him. They won't pay attention to his speech. Don't you find that um, striking? That the Lord always speaks to us. He speaks truth to us, but the world does not listen to him. And all of you who answered in accordance with those dreams, you just verified a clear message that the Lord is working and operating and speaking. But we can't be like those in times of old. Or in present times, who will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord, who speaks in many aspects of our lives. See, when the Lord speaks, he doesn't speak a different thing to each person. He speaks the same thing to all of us. The same exact message, which is why he sent a prophet with one message for all people. So you know that when he's speaking, he's speaking the one thing to all of us. And collectively, we can verify that speech every single time. 
Don't let people fool you into saying that can't be done. You just did it. You just now did it. And as the Lord speaks, he's doing something. Clearly, he's giving the exact same message. But a choice is coming. A choice is going to look terrible if you choose the moral side of it. But in fact, that will be a blessing. If you choose the easy way out thinking you're going to save everything, that will be the path of death. That's what he has communicated. Not to trust. The choice by sight. But to know that choice by the Spirit. To make your decision by the Spirit. He speaks loudly these days. And the more he speaks, well, the more the world dives into some esoteric realm. Getting people's minds ready to refute things of faith. To pressure. Threatening tactics. To get you to agree and to negate faith. To walk against faith. It's happening on all levels now. Watch for it. Because these kingdoms of this world are going to become very strong and prosperous. And it's going to look like that is the way that you want to live. It'll be a guaranteed death. Remember the dreams. That's all you have to do. Remember that all of you, many of you, have shared in the same set of circumstances in those dreams. That's all you have to do. Refer back to them. Now that you've seen your brothers and sisters answer, those of you in the chat rooms, Now you know. Those of you listening who can't see the chat rooms, lots of folks are putting ones in there because they had that same series of dreams. Those are spiritual dreams. Now the time has come where we shouldn't respond by fear at all. Did you notice in those dreams there was always time to analyze the issue. God made sure you understood the issue, didn't he? You understood the choice. See, that's one of the major things. While everybody gets excited over the conditions or nervous over the conditions, they understood the choice. And as you understand the choice, so make your decision based off that understanding that your father has given you. He's helped you out, and he will continue to help you out, but he will not choose for you. This is your truth. This is your time. This is your beginning. And, of course, Satan will do everything he can to make you choose death over life. You know, in the Bible, when it says they call good evil and evil good, the reversal of things, things will look one way but be another. That's happening right now before your eyes. And you have to start to apply that spiritually to your walk of faith. Never forgetting what your father has already given you. Because what he's given you is precious. It's above board. It's quite amazing. It builds confidence. It will help you every step of the way. All you have to do is recall it. Because these kingdoms of this world, you know how everybody, I, uh, listen, I know I do not agree with most people out there. I already know that. And most of those folks know I'm quirky and I don't agree with them either. Right? But again, I have to go with what the Lord gives me. You're going to see a system form so luring and tempting that if you're not careful, you're going to choose it in a heartbeat. But I mean by tempting, I mean this. Imagine the average person is out there struggling, right? 
you're trying to make ends meet, you're trying to keep your whatever you have for the sake of your family, keep them reasonably happy, but all of a sudden, opportunities start popping up out of the blue. I mean, big opportunities. Finances start coming from all different directions. It's coming. And do you know what's going to happen to most people who have been trying to make ends meet all of a sudden? They're going to find themselves living in a type of utopia. It's coming. It is going to blindside people. All those folks, right, who people think are politically corrupt, all those folks are going to be going away. Do you know that? All of them. They're going to be going away. It'll seem like a brand new set of people are coming in who are making the right choices. Life will become more fulfilling. Very fulfilling. Many will take part in the prosperity of the, of the newness of what's about to happen. It's going to seem harmless. It's going to seem like the right choice. But during that time, people are going to start being indoctrinated in ways they never thought possible. When I say indoctrinated, right? When everybody around you is happy, when everybody around you is content after having such a hard time, and all of a sudden, right? All of a sudden, they're happy. You start getting out more. You're accepted. You start agreeing and with things that they agree to. Happens every time. That means, suppose you're a person of faith, but all of a sudden your life changes. You're now happier. You have new friends, right? Listen. That means when they have conversations, you'll start agreeing with certain aspects of that conversation before you know it. If you continue to hang around that group, you're going to agree with the whole conversation. But that conversation is going to be based on immoral practices, ideologies. You know how you just turn a blind eye to a conversation? People will do that more and more. But by doing that, they'll further involve themselves in more conversations. And over the course of just a little bit of time, many will start compromising their spiritual values. In Revelation, when the two witnesses lay dead in the streets, what did the people do? They celebrated. They gave presents to one another. Where did they get the money from? What does that tell you about that kingdom? What does that tell you? The kingdom of the beast. He told the world that they should make an image to the beast. Where did they get the materials from? Prosperity was happening. That kingdom of darkness is going to look like the best thing that ever happened to this world. It's not going to have horns on it. The Lord has already warned us that Satan will manifest himself as an angel of light. That means he'll manifest himself as the answer. It's going to look like the right thing to do, the right idea. It's going to be like a vacuum that will suck everybody in that it can. Now, once your status in life changes, those of you who struggle now, once your status in life changes, you're not going to want to give that up. So I need to remind you of something here. Many of you have been in life, and I've heard your complaints. I've heard so many people say so many times, when does it ever get easier? You don't want it to get easier. You struggle all this time, and all of a sudden, at the end of the matter, you're going to have massive prosperity. If you take it, listen to me, if you take it, you're not going to so easily give it up again. Do you know that? After being under pressure for so long, once you're free, once you live free like that, you're not going to want to give it up. You'll start saying anything you can say to keep it. 
That's the hook. That's the hook. You'll start compensating everything and compromising everything about yourselves to justify why you should keep what you have, why you should stay where you are. All of us need to be reminded we called out on the Lord because of pressure, didn't we? The Lord showed us that there was a power greater than us, the individual, that was pressing us down on many different sides. It could have been financial. It could have been moral. It could have been with your families. It could have been with life or death with a spouse or something like that. But it caused us to seek the Lord. We sought the one thing, the one thing we could trust at that time that could do something about the issue that we had. And that was Christ. That was the Father. Don't forget that. Because in these times coming up, there are going to be people who have built the trust in the Most High. Listen to me. They're going to be usurped by these systems. They're going to start enjoying themselves and having things they never had before. And they're not going to want to give it up. And because they're, they're not going to want to give it up, they're going to start compensating. For every rule in those kingdoms, they're going to say, well, it's okay. And God's okay with this. And God's okay with that. And God's not, you know, he's not going to be mad at this. And he understands this. Then you're going to notice that the entire Bible is going to alter right before your eyes. That's already happening. Because you have a lot of people building that bridge now. I just heard a minister say that violence was okay. Remember something. The Lord orchestrated your life to save your life. He got you to look to him through your situation. Your situation is not some curse. Your situation was a lifeline. You would not have called upon him the way you did if not for your situation. Your situation was not a curse, nor was it a problem or anything else. And anything that you lost here is secured with him right now. Do you hear me? Don't buy the lie. Don't buy the lie and count your losses. Your children are the Messiah. There are no losses. Your life has been orchestrated to get you to turn to Christ. You didn't have to, but you did. And he responded to you. That faith you have in you, that was put in you, that you would believe. So that means your father was looking for you from the beginning. And he was mindful of you from the beginning to orchestrate your life, to have it saved. All your problems and circumstances and everything else did nothing more than to start stripping flesh and ideologies off of you that you would turn to Christ in truth. He ruined some of you by way of the flesh only so you would not go out and spoil yourselves in the world. And because you thought you were spoiled, you thought less of yourselves. But you turned directly to Christ. I hope you understand that. I really do hope you understand what the Lord has done in your life. Because that means even your parents were set up to get you here. And even they had to be here to have you, so their parents were sent. And everything that happened in their lives and the lives of those that were before them and before them and before them was the sown of yours. Do you understand that? That all people who come to Christ, their life is highly purposed. 
There is nothing you're in God can't deliver you from. Stop thinking about what you're trapped in. And give thanks that you turn to him. That is the step many won't make. You do know that, right? Many will not do that. Many are called, few are chosen. They're called. But they won't be chosen because they won't turn to Christ. They'll turn to other things, but they won't turn to Christ. You respond it by your truth where you were. Continue in your truth where you are. Continue. No matter what your physical condition is, continue. No matter what your addiction is, continue. You know, when your mind says, gives you this task list of everything you have to have together before you go to Christ, stop listening to that. You know how a long time ago they used to say, come as you are? But they didn't really mean it. Well, I mean it. If you're stuck like Chuck, then come as you are. If you're shackled to something, then come with the shackles. Come as you are. We're not the ones that break anything off of our lives. The Lord is. Many of you are shackled for a reason to show you that you're not going to have them broken by anybody else. Some of you should know by now that nobody can help you in your problem. Do you not know that everybody was meant to fail? That only your father may succeed. Hope you know that. See, because the Lord knows you, and he knows that if anything would have worked for you so far, you would have lifted up that thing. No, it's not going to work that way. Now everybody knows you're stuck. So that when you are delivered, you'll tell everybody the truth. Nope, the Lord did this. Was the program, no, it wasn't the program, the Lord did this. Was it that, uh, you know, that method you applied? Nope, wasn't that method, the Lord did this. Everything failed but Christ. That's going to be your end result. Because when you're free, all the noise you made in life when you're free, all those who heard that noise, are going to see a true wonder through you. There's a promise on your life. Then others will glorify Christ because of you. You don't know that promise. It's a scripture. It's a declaration over your life. That because of you, somebody is going to glorify Christ. The word says that Christ will be glorified in his saints. A saint is not something a person will name themselves ever. What man calls himself is not what God calls him. If the Father calls you a saint, that's what you are. If a man calls himself a saint, he, he just messed up. He can't do that. That's a title only God can give. And Christ will be glorified in the saints. Your life is being used. Bring honor to the Messiah. That's why the Bible says, don't think it's strange when you go through fiery trials. Let me put it in English, when nobody has an answer for you. When you're not free, when you're still shackled, and you're still crying. Don't think that to be strange. Your father knows exactly what he's doing. He knows. You don't know. He knows. All that's required of us is to be true to him. Do you hear me? True to him. You know, being true to him means you're not going to be your own deliverer. You can forget that and out the window. That's not going to happen. How many have tried to deliver themselves only to go back into bondage again? 
How many did that multiple times? Huh? How many thought they were free of something, went and told some folks, only to find out you were not free at all? The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. See, because if Christ gets the glory through you, you better believe it's going to be authentic. It's not going to be some made-up thing. It's not going to be some made-up testimony, or what you think is a testimony. It's going to be the real deal. When the Lord works, he works with power. So the real deal will come through you. There's only one, only one, that is your deliverer. And he's not earthbound. You are in good hands. See, because one day, you're not going to be in this body anymore with the aches and pains and the addictions and the shackles and everything else and the reputation. You're going to be free from all that. You're going to be untouched and brand new. And in that moment, you're going to realize, wait a minute, nothing ever hurt me. Nothing touched me. Nothing harmed me. The only thing that could ever happen to me on earth was that something would touch and get to my flesh, but it never touched me. It has no residue. I'm truly free. And see, if you get there like that, and you find out you've never been touched, Don't you think your Lord wants you free? He wants you free from that idea that somehow you messed up so bad, right? Because in truth, you're going to be brand new. You're going to find that you have never been harmed. You've never been tainted. You've never been touched. You have no scars. You have no wounds. You have no anything. But everything that happened to you on this earth only happened to your flesh. That's what you're going to find out. But you yourselves are going to be brand new. Now, how many people will have given in to everything here on this earth because of their flesh and blew the whole thing? Hmm? They will have blown the whole thing over an outfit. Your flesh is like a clothing. That clothing can be exchanged. You, the wearer of that clothing, nothing is ever permitted to ever touch you that way. So you've never been touched. But your clothing has been ripped, scarred, chained to things, abused, and everything else. But when you take it off, all the conditions of that clothing no longer exist. And just how would a person feel when they find that out? When they find out they cursed God because their shirt got ripped. When they find out that they cursed and disobeyed God because their pants got cut off. Hmm? How awful of a feeling that would be. You, you ever wake up from a dream and in that dream you were in real trouble. But when you woke up, you found out, wait a minute, nothing touched me. I'm okay. But then you realize how stupid the decision was in the dream. It only happens for a split second. You only have that reasoning for a split second and then it starts going away. You ever do that before? You ever do something real dumb in a dream because you thought you were in trouble, but you wake up out of the dream and you find that nothing has ever touched you? Life is that dream, and you're about to wake up, and you're going to find out nothing ever touched you, but that you were here to make a decision, and you blew. Many people are going to blow that decision because they continue to trust what they see, they continue to act immorally trying to save themselves. You have a Savior. Christ is saving you. You don't save yourself. Christ is saving you. Haven't you noticed in your dreams, there's always another element. There's another element in your dreams. When you stop trying to save yourself, your dream is interrupted. Trial is over. When you save yourself, you go deeper into a hole. Have you ever found that out? And then you wake up, sometimes shameful, at what you did to save your own life, at what you did to continue to survive. Hmm? Life is that dream. And these kingdoms are going to be your test part of it. 
Why do you think God has not destroyed Satan? God can get rid of anything he wants to get rid of, yet he allows demons to continue. He allows the fallen to continue, and he allows Satan to continue. Why? Because it's just like the nature of your dreams. That's why. The real question here is this. In your soul of souls, who are you? And who you really are is coming out with everything you do. The sum total of who you are yeah. It's going to be just like that dream. See, when you were ready to give up your life, to do the right thing, the dream was over. When you tried to save your own skin, the dream got worse, didn't it? Didn't it? Well, I'll tell you something in this world. When you choose righteousness over your own life, That's it. Because if you do that, that means you chose God in all conditions. Do you know that? See, hear me on this. If anything can cause you to do something unrighteous, then anything can cause you to fall away from the living God in eternity. Do you think you'll suffer anybody falling away again? Nope. Do you think you'll suffer anybody changing their mind, being lured away by anything in the kingdom of God ever again? Nope. When you choose righteousness in a dream, even to the point of death, your dream is over. When you choose unrighteousness, you only do so to save your own life. And what that means is, what that translates to, is this, if your existence is ever threatened somehow in eternity, or if something arises that will threaten you, you'll easily turn on the Father to save yourself. That will not be a son or daughter of the Most High. Hmm? Yeah, that is. That's why in the Bible it says, Right? In the Bible it says those who seek to save their lives are going to lose it. Doesn't it clearly say that? Because if you seek to save your own life, you put your own life above everything else. That means you cannot be trusted to be loyal to anything for your life is in danger. That's what that means. Do you see it? If you save your own life, in every circumstance, how can you be trusted to be loyal to anything else other than you yourself? You can't. No matter how much you say you can be loyal to something, you will never be loyal when your life is threatened. But those who make it, the Bible says they love not their lives unto death. And you know what that means? Nothing will break the loyalty they will have. And since God is eternal, then that relationship will also be eternal, and nothing will ever be able to break it. See, God doesn't build us to automatically say yes. He didn't design us to automatically say yes. He wants children, not robots. Children, right? Sons who make up their own mind, but who choose him. You all see that? That's why things are being built up to. That's why things are so incredibly important right now. That's why this walk of faith is important. That's why we have not seen anything. Anybody can follow anything once it's proven to them. If we saw the awe of the living God, all of us to, to we'd be so frightened, we'd never sin again. But the Lord has not shown us that side of himself, has he? So by faith we follow him. 
making up our own minds. And those who are found loyal without seeing him will most certainly be loyal when they do see him. Hmm? Even in my own life, when I have to see something, it means I never believed it in the first place. That's what it means. And I've noticed if I have to see something to really accept it, I will scrutinize it. And I always find something. I do. If I were to ever accept something by faith, I never have to scrutinize it. I simply appreciate it when it's in my presence. I've noticed that. I have noticed that. See, because if I need proof of something, I don't want to believe it in the first place. Oh, there it is. Mystery solved. When you need proof, you don't want to believe it in the first place. You don't want to believe it. Right? That's why when, the, when the, those who have love within them are young, right, they can be so easily tricked. They love love so much, they're willing to believe all things of love. They are. And so they can be duped when they're young. They most certainly can be. Hmm. Somebody says, uh, Mike, why did Peter deny Jesus three times and still be forgiven? Because the Lord, he denied him. He gave him a message. He said, you can deny me, Right. He said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. Peter said, no, I'm not, Lord. I'm going to be with you forever. He was showing Peter something. Listen to me. You can. But Peter was just starting out, by the way, right? And he was boasting of how he was going to follow Christ all the way to the end. And Jesus said, no, you're not. Don't you sit there and brag on yourself and say that you're going to follow me all the way to the ends of the earth. You're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. That's what he said. You know, when you have people out there saying nothing, nothing is going to cause me to stop saying that. Stop saying that. The Lord is doing things. He's, he's preparing your life. He's raising you. We can't raise ourselves without the Lord. We're not going to make it. He's the one preparing us. Listen, if I didn't have certain dreams, I would have fallen flat on my face many years ago and never got up again. The Lord has been preparing everything. The Lord has been orchestrating everything. He's the one that strengthens us through various processes called life. He's doing that. We're not. When sometimes when we brag about what we're going to become and what we're going to do, we're just talking hot things, right? Because if the Lord does not prepare us, he has already discovered our weaknesses, our faults, and everything else. He designed us. He knows us. So the Lord is telling us, don't sit there and brag on yourselves, but be thankful. Be thankful of my love. Be thankful of my process upon your life. I am doing this. You know, in the Bible, it says he will finish the work he began in us, right? So he is the one delivering us. Peter couldn't boast on himself. That would be Peter delivering himself. In no case has any man ever delivered himself that way. The Lord is delivering us. All these people say, I can't figure it out. Of course you can't, because you're not going to deliver yourselves. The Lord is doing it. So when Peter bragged and said, Lord, nothing, you know, I'm going to be with you, and we're going to go through this together. No, you're not. No, you're not. In other words, stop boasting. He told Peter, stop boasting, right? He rebuked Peter. He did. He told Peter, stop sleeping on the job because Satan desired him. But in all those statements, he was telling us about our lives. That's what he was telling us. He is our deliverer. He is orchestrating our lives to a degree that we gain strength for every quality we need to be authentic. He's the one doing it. We cannot orchestrate our own future. So that means you have an adversary against God's process. His name is Satan or the dragon, right? And he's against God's process of your preparation, which means you're always going to have an alternative to escape to. And when you take the easy way, the immoral way, that's not God's way. 
That's what Satan sets up to get you off that path of victory. Satan is the one that embraces you. He's the first one to embrace you when life falls apart. Your father does not embrace you as soon as your life falls apart. He does not. I know what the songs say, but that's not what he does. He will let you see where you are. He'll even give you a mind to see how you got there. And he'll do it in such a way that you have no other alternative but to reflect. And he will raise you up in truth, not in falsehoods. He does not play patty cake with you all the way to the finish. Satan is the one that comes up with a soft voice. It's okay. Everybody falls. That's what Satan does. That's not what your father does. Your father is all about truth. He is not that soft voice that cushions your fall. No, he does not. He allows you to see what that fall is. And he teaches you how to get up. You know those people that come into your life? When you're way down, 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 they come into your life and they're down too. But then when you start to go up in Christ, they get angry at you and separate from you. Huh? Who sent that person? Not your father. Your father doesn't send you somebody who's going to keep you down in life, who does not like him. No. Those are agents of Satan. They're sent to get a grip on you so that you will not spiritually break free. They're sent to keep you right there in this spot away from the living God. They are there to manage how much you can get of the gospel. That's why they have something to say every time somebody speaks the gospel into you, here they come. Here they come to take it out. Here they come to challenge the seed that was sown into you because they do not want that seed to grow in you because they will lose if it does. And if you believe their rhetoric, you'll start to emulate what they said. And then you'll end up asking somebody else, I can't be helped, can I? You'll start speaking just like they spoke to you. But that's good news. Now that you know, when you start speaking like the negative person that was in your life, now you know what the problem is. You also know how to break free. You break free by pressing towards Christ, no matter what. You don't break free by smacking somebody. You don't break free by boasting and doing all that stuff. Nope, you point yourself towards Christ and you go, you go full speed straight towards Christ, no matter what. Because now you know you have an agent. Now you know that you're speaking the same doubtful things they did to you. And now you know where it comes from. And it did not come from your father. It came from an agent dispatched to you to keep you in one spot, and that is down on the ground. Time for you to stand up. Stand up by facing Christ. You start walking toward him. The Lord said, come follow me. That's what he said. It's that easy. So now start to recognize your own speech, and you'll see where your speech came from. Because the Lord will only give us a certain type of language. And doubtful speaking does not come from him. Hmm? That's when we believe an agent sent by darkness. We emulate what they have spoken. God put the truth in you. Satan is one that sows these evil seeds called lies and doubt and self-pity. Oh, yes, he also self. When you have a self pity story, you say, War is me before everybody. That's not speaking faith. See, when you tell someone the truth about your situation, that's one thing. When you say, War is me, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do know what to do. You know what to turn towards Christ. Why would you tell everybody you don't know what to do and you already know to go to the Lord? All of us know the downsides of a situation. But who's going to teach us how to walk towards Christ in the middle of that 
catastrophe. Hmm? Didn't Jesus, in the middle of a storm, say, come on? Didn't he say, don't be afraid? Hmm? Did he say that? If you start looking to Christ in the middle of your crisis, you may be afraid, but you won't advertise to the world your misery. What you will start doing is say, wait a minute, I know my life is shambles right now, but I have a hope. I have a hope. Let me go walk on this water. Because that water is that storm, is it not? You already know that if you look at the crisis and you start believing all the language around that crisis, you're going to start sinking in the crisis. But if you face Christ, you can walk on the water. But as soon as you look at the crisis, you're going to start believing all the voices that come from the crisis more than the word that comes from the Lord. Crises will come. They're always going to come. So stop looking at it. You already know they're going to come. Continue to look to Christ. That storm came for a reason. You know that, don't you? That storm was their deliverance, and they didn't even know it. They didn't even know that storm was designed to deliver them. All they could see was a storm. They could not perceive the deliverance. The walking on the water thing was extra. You may have missed that one. Don't worry, we'll cover that one day. But you may have missed that one. The walking on the water, that was extra. The storm came for their deliverance. Not to be a burden. So is your life. Do you know with every crisis, you grow? Some people don't like it either. They get mad when they grow. I always seem to have problems. Well, that means you always seem to be growing. Isn't that something? As soon as a problem comes, we have a bad habit of saying, Lord, deliver me. But he's the one that sent it. No storm can come to you unless the Lord send it. I hope you know that. Satan is not permitted to send a storm your way. Satan did not cause a storm those disciples were in. You belong to the Lord. There are certain rights Satan does not have concerning your life. These are not the days of Job. The days of Job are over. This is the time of the Messiah. The time of fulfillment. The time of deliverance. Folks, I'll be back in just a few minutes right here at COT. Okay, I'm back, and yes, I said it. God sent that storm. All right, let's get this part straight. This normally happens, right? Part of today's thinking, not your fault. So let's put everything in perspective. How did Satan touch Job? Could Satan just run up and touch Job? Hmm? And why was God so kind to Satan? Did you read the book of Job? Did he not say, Satan, what's your problem? What's wrong, buddy? Huh? So let me break this down to you real quick so you get it. There's our father who is the creator. Nothing exists without him. Satan was created. He fell. Jimmy cracked corn. So what? The fallen angels fell. Jimmy cracked corn. So what? Whose power are they under? By what power do they exist? The living God. And again, Job. God said, what's wrong with you? Well, no one is worthy of me. Everybody is so easy to corrupt. Have you considered my servant Job? Sure I have, but you put a hedge around him, and I can't touch him. Uh-oh, I can't touch him. Okay, see, I'm going to take the hedge down. Now, you can't take his life. But you can do everything else. 
Okay, yippee, yippee, and Satan goes and does his thing. Who sent the storm? Satan can't so much as fart without God's permission, right? There you are. He does not exist without God's permission. Fallen angels couldn't even fall without God's permission. Those things that come out of the bottomless pit can't do a thing without God's permission. We all have it now, don't we? So our Father allows or disallows. There is no one operating by total, autonomous, total autonomy. What about you and your life? The Lord had already told us. He already told us through tons of people, don't think it's strength when you go through fiery trials. Why? Because they're working something. They are working something in you. They wouldn't come unless they were working something. Why did Jesus speak peace to that storm? He said, peace be still. My goodness. Did he say, go, get away from me? No, he didn't say that. He did not say that. He said, peace be still. He is the word of God, the same word that sent the storm, right? Said, well, time for the storm to stop. Peace be still. The same one who sent it is the same one that said, that's enough. That's enough. Just like your issue. At any moment, Jesus can say, that's enough. And the storm has no choice. Your issue has no choice but to subside. The Father orchestrates all of it because this is his creation. In the Old Testament, it says, what? God said, what? I created the good and the evil. God did that. He created the good and the evil for his purpose. It does not run on its own. So never fear the darkness. Your Father is behind an orchestrated effort to have you fully delivered. That's what this is all about. I know it's not well understood because of the world. The world is running chicken behind Satan, not you. You should know exactly who he is. He's like Uncle Fester. He's like the uncle. Nobody wants to go and see you sitting in that room over there ready to stir up trouble. That's who Satan is. To you, he's a fallen foe. He stands against the word of God. That's why he's an adversary. He is not your jailer. He's not your competition. Don't you remember what Jesus said? He's giving you power to tread upon scorpions and serpents and all power over the enemy. So what are you afraid of? God is orchestrating your life. And Jesus Christ is in charge. Never forget that. Never forget that. Not one, not one particle could move unless God permits it. And if he knows the count of every hair on your head, my head, and everybody else's head, then he knows where every particle is in existence. Do you hear me? Your life is orchestrated to deliver you. If you think along those lines, you'll start seeing the truth. And the moment you see the truth is when you stop blaming everything. You won't blame anything ever again. Because those who see the truth rejoice. They rejoice, not because the problem is over, but because they see what God is doing. And what he does is very consistent from beginning to end. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He changes not. He's doing it in your life, my life, and everybody else's life. The world is the one that confuses that message. We should not. And that's why the truth is so important. It's also why the truth has fought so much. Now you know. So never fear these things in the earth. No. Have an understanding of what your father's doing. 
You are a living soul. Do you know what that means? If somebody came and shot you to pieces, that does not destroy you. That doesn't destroy you. You're a living soul. Bullets don't work against the soul. Nuclear weapons don't work against the soul. They don't. None of that stuff does. The only one that can destroy your soul is your Father in Heaven. Nobody else has authority nor power to do that. That means you're an eternal being. My goodness. And here we are, afraid of splinters. Annoyances. Hmm? Understand who you are. Understand what God made you to be. Understand his process of deliverance in your life. That's why the gospel of Jesus Christ, that word gospel means good news of Jesus Christ. Now your iniquities can be fully removed. That's good news, isn't it? Everything you ever did wrong can be fully removed. You know what that means? That's absolute deliverance. That's a guaranteed deliverance. That's why it's good news. And that's why. Absolutely good news. Hmm? I had to say that because normally... Whenever you talk about the apostles and Peter walking on the water in the middle of that storm, the entire situation sometimes is sensationalized. And so is the trouble of that situation sensationalized. And oftentimes we forget who the creator is and what he has dominion over and what he has assigned to us, what he has assigned to all. Most importantly, we forget this entire story is about us. Do you know that? The entire story is about you. And if you understand that, your socks should be off. Because that will knock your socks off when you do understand it. The entire story is about you. That's when all this is about and all eyes are on planet Earth right now because of you, because of the story, because of the birth that is about to take place. Remember who you are in Christ. Remember that. Folks, it is that time. I'm a skedaddle, but I will see you guys tomorrow. I will. And I have a short message at midnight tonight. All right? I do. I want to say God bless everybody. I'll see you guys at midnight tonight and tomorrow. You guys be blessed always. Always. I'll see you guys next time right here at COT.